Hello, and thank you for joining us for the sixth of our webinar series celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, or NCHEMS. As you may know, NCHEMS has been turning data into knowledge for state, national, and international policymakers for a long time. And today, we're going to share some of the strategies and techniques that we've used and refined. I am Sally Johnstone, president of NCHEMS, and will be listening to the panelists discuss a set of issues for the first part of this webinar. Then we'll ask them to respond to your questions. Now, this webinar features some of my colleagues here at NCHEMS who are on our data and analysis team. Rachel Christensen, Christensen frequently works on projects related to strategic planning and help states as well as systems better utilize the data they have on hand in decision making. She also supports other NCHEM staff with her keen data visualization skills. Gina Johnson typically runs projects related to helping institutions and systems enhance data informed decision making as well. Her work is concentrated most heavily on developing analytics, institutional research, assessment, and evaluation capacity, particularly through strategic partnerships and collaborations. John Clark is our expert at pulling, aggregating, normalizing, and cleaning data from such sources as the American Community Survey, Current Population Survey, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System, or IPEDS. John uses these data to help build and inform NCHEM student flow models, workforce supply and demand models, to update and expand NCHEM's databases, and other ongoing intensive data projects, like the Luminous Strong Nation Report and the Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence. Now, in addition to overseeing the information technology needs of NCHEMS, Linda Leba maintains over 50 years of IPEDS and its precursor, Higher Education General Information Surveys, or HEGIS, data. And today, she's going to share some tips about working with IPEDS and really all big data sets. Now, to run the webinar, we're joined today by two more of my colleagues here at NCHEMS. Sarah Torres Lugo, who will monitor the questions you want to ask, the panelists, and Liz Weeks, who'll be managing the webinar. When you are ready to pose a question or make a comment, please click on the Q&A in the controls. If you're in a full screen mode, you may need to hover your mouse over the screen and make the controls visible. Once you click on the Q&A, a window appears, and please type your question in the text field and then click send to submit it. If you want to pose a question to a specific panelist, please make sure to begin your question with the name of that panelist. The chat function isn't going to be monitored, so please use only the Q&A function. Now, today's webinar will cover a bunch of key topics and data visualization, tips for higher ed data, and really a primer on how to work with your audience to assure you share the message that you intend. Then we'll get to your questions. Rachel, you want to get us started? Sure. Thank you, Sally. The focus of our webinar today is data visualization. And so to get us started, I'd like to share with everyone some key considerations that I've found are important to think about when you're starting a project that you intend to visualize. So on the next slide, there are four questions that I frequently ask myself as I'm developing visualizations for a data analysis project. And those questions are, first, what story am I trying to tell? Second, what are the key takeaways from my analysis? Third, how much information should I share in my visualization? And then finally, does the visualization I've created follow best practices? And so I'll be covering each of these points in more detail in this section of the webinar. And as I do so, I'll be highlighting some examples for you that illustrate each of these points. In these examples, I'm going to use a project that we've worked on here at Enchim. This project was for the Iowa College Aid Commission, who asked us to develop these visualizations for them. For context, the intention for the project was to analyze how grants provided by the commission 
support IUN's ability to pay for college in combination with other sources of funding and tuition levels. And we also wanted to answer questions for them, such as for whom are affordability gaps greatest, and how do the various elements of financial support contribute to affordability? Our audience for this work was the commission themselves, so they could use our analyses to reconsider their policies in the hopes of addressing affordability for the students of Iowa. With that, let's go to the next slide and dive into our first consideration. What story am I trying to tell? One of the most important things many people who create data visualizations will tell you is that you shouldn't start building anything until you've thought about what questions you're trying to answer. Like with any good research, you wanna start with questions in mind and know what you're trying to communicate. You may not know the answers as you begin, but it's important to have a clear sense of the overall message you hope to convey. A second important point is to consider who your audience is. Gina will dig into audience considerations a little bit later in this talk, or in the webinar, but I want to emphasize the point now that the level of analysis, and especially the type of visualization you create, is going to be very dependent on who you plan on sharing the information with. You might want something very high level for someone such as a president or system leader, legislator, or the public, and then you might, might want something much more robust and detailed for maybe another analyst in an institutional research office or someone else that you're working with that you know is very familiar with the data. So it's really important to consider what level of understanding your audience is going to have and how they intend to use whatever visualization you're creating. Finally, once you know your audience, you're gonna to wanna to consider whether your visualization needs to be static or dynamic. There are so many great tools out there now for business intelligence and creating visualizations. And they give you a lot of flexibility in creating dynamic visualizations. You can add filters to things. You can allow users to click around and explore. You can add things like hover over labeling to provide more information. But that's not always going to be what you want. For some users, you may want something that's just one simple snapshot of your data or one chart that summarizes, you know, answers the question, and can be shared wildly, um, and even printed. So it's important to keep that in mind as you create visualizations and are making decisions about how complex to make things. So on the next slide, I've included a few questions that guided our work for the Iowa College Age project. As we sat down and looked at what data was available and what the intention of the project was, we came up with a few more specific questions that led to the visualizations we created, which I'll show you a few of in future slides. So the first of those questions was how much money is being awarded from each program? Iowa has several different pots of aid they award, and we thought it was important to understand how much money was being awarded under each of the many aid programs which led into our second question, are the funds going to low or high income students? We thought it was important again for the commission to understand both how the money was being distributed and who it was being distributed to. The third question we set out to answer was whether or not the awarded aid is meeting the needs of students from different income bands. And then finally, we wanted to know just some basic information on how many of the aid receiving students fall into each income band. So these were very specific questions that were guided by the overall intention of the project, but could then be turned into individual visualizations. So on the next slide, we'll talk more about the second consideration. Once you've decided what questions you want to answer, and you get your data together and run some analyses, you need to decide what the key takeaways are and communicate those in the visualization. You don't want the visualization itself to substitute the story, but rather make sure the visualization is expressing the messages you want highlighted from your data analysis. In writing and other media, they often say to show and not tell, but here I think it's important to both show and tell. Make sure you're showing the data in a way that's understandable, but also telling the key messages you want your audience to grasp. It's also important to avoid what's frequently called nar narrative data mining. Be sure the data are telling the story and the story is not telling the data. There can be temptation to omit things, apply filters, or manipulate the data to fit the story you wanted to tell. And so it's important to be aware of that and to always communicate the case honestly and ethically. On our next slide, I'll show an example. On the first slide here, I've included an example from the Iowa College Age Project. This chart was created to answer the question, how many of our students fall into each income band? Because this chart was intended to show what portion of the whole represented each student group, we used the pie chart. And as you can see here, you can find the answer pretty easily and identify how big the slice of pie is for all these various groups of students, but that doesn't necessarily highlight the most important piece of information. So here we added a note that emphasizes the big takeaway from this chart, which is that over one third of Iowans who completed FAFSA were from low-income families. 
And that was a message we thought it was really important to highlight for the commission. In our next example on the next slide, we have a chart we created to answer the larger question of whether the awarded aid was meeting the needs of students from different income bands. Here, we have a bar chart with each bar representing different groups of students across the x-axis based on um, their adjusted gross income and which income group they fall in, and then total funding they receive for college on the y-axis. Each bar then shows the total aid a student is receiving, including their funds from EFD, their expected financial contribution and work, um, and the colors represent what the source of that aid is. So one noticeable takeaway here in this chart is that the bars on the left representing the lower income students have less funds available to them for college. But a more important takeaway became obvious once we added in the line, which represents the average cost of attendance, in this case, for private nonprofit four-year institutions in Iowa. Now, with the line added, we can see that not only do lower income students have less funds available, but they don't have access to enough resources to afford the cost of attendance, which is really the takeaway we found most important. On the next slide, I'll get into our third consideration, which is how much information you should share when creating your visualization. The main point here is that economy of information is key. I've included a quote here from Herbert Simon, who's a very well-known social scientist from both the fields of psychology and economics, who said back in 1971 that a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. Basically, having a lot of information can be really great, but can also mean that you don't know what to pay attention to. So when you're creating data visualizations, it's important to think about really limiting the amount of information you're including and focusing on what you really want the audience to pay attention to. You have to find the balance between including enough so that your visualization is interesting and understandable and conveys your message, but not too much so it's not cluttered or overwhelming. And so on the next slide, I'm including an example that answers the question of where students at various Iowa universities are coming from across the state. Um, incomes and economic conditions vary widely across the counties in Iowa. So this chart allowed us to make the point that students generally attend colleges close to home, so colleges will need to be affordable for their regional economy. Each of, these, each of these maps includes colors representing what percent of students are going to the school in question and a label of where that school is, as well as labels for the counts and percentages for each county. And I think the picture overall is starting to get a bit cluttered. But if you look at the next slide, We've cleaned up the charts a bit, and here we only have the colors and the institution labels. And this more easily communicates our main message. Most schools are pulling their students from close to their own location, or most students are attending colleges close to home. So while the other information was useful and interesting, um, it doesn't really move, convey the message that we're hoping to, and this makes the map a little bit more cluttered. So finally, my last point is the idea that you need to make sure your visualizations are following best practices. There's some really great research out there now that shows how users pay attention to information and how best you can help them interpret data. Here are some key things I've read and come across that help make a visualization easier to understand. First, it's important to choose the right chart type. There's so many different chart, chart, chart types out there that you can build in different software, but you really need to think about what kind of data you have and how it relates to each other and make sure you're picking the most appropriate type. For example, if you're looking at something longitudinally, a line chart might make the most sense to connect each of those points. But on the other hand, if you're comparing data that's unrelated to each other, a line graph wouldn't make any sense and you'd be better off with a bar chart or something else. Similarly, you'd only want to use a pie chart if you're displaying some data points that add up to 100%. You see a lot of examples out there of bad visualizations that show pie slices adding up to more than 100, which is slightly against best practices and can be just downright confusing. Once you've figured out what kind of chart to use, you wanna make sure your chart is readable. And here's some points that are worth paying attention to. Your orientation. Does it make more sense for your chart to be horizontal or vertical? Is the font one that's easy to read on different devices and that looks clear and uncluttered and you know, nothing too fancy? Is it a good size? Is it easy to look at? Are there labels that help make sense of what the chart is telling you? Is the scale of things appropriate? Is there one data point, possibly an outlier, it's throwing off the scale of the rest of the chart and making other differences less noticeable. And finally, your scroll bars and sizing. Can you, need, can you see what you need to see about the chart without having to scroll back and forth to look at labels or legends or things like that? And can it be viewed on different devices just as well as others? Another important one to think about is if it could be printed, if it will print consistently on your average size piece of paper. Another thing to think about in terms of best practices is being consistent. 
You want to make sure you're being consistent with your data definitions and not comparing apples and oranges. Linda's going to spend some time in a minute talking about IPEDS, which is the United States Federal Higher Education Data Collection System. And within that data set, there are lots of variables that are defined very differently across sectors and types of institutions. So you need to pay attention to making sure you're staying consistent within a single chart or visualization. Legends are another one. If blue means one thing in this chart, it should represent the same thing in another chart, or your readers can end up confused. And color schemes in general are important. You don't want to use too many colors, or your visualization will end up very busy looking, and the categories will be hard to distinguish. And you also want to be aware of the fact that your pretty colorful chart may end up being printed in black and white someday. So you need to make sure the message is still coming across and not rely too heavily on those colors. And finally, make sure you're using your statistics appropriately. John will be highlighting this a bit later in the presentation, but I'm sure we've all seen examples of how the bad or even unethical use of statistics can lead to misinterpretation and misinformation. And now on the next slides, I'll show you a few examples of visualizations that are not following these best practices that I've just shared. So first we have what looks like a line chart that's showing an upward trend in jobs lost every quarter. But the more you look at this chart, you can see that this isn't actually job loss by quarter, but instead is a cumulative number of jobs lost. So it's not that we lost 15 million jobs in, the June, of, in June of 2010, which would be pretty concerning. It's that as of 2010, we've lost 15 million jobs. Not that that's necessarily much better. So first, the title here is incorrect. This chart isn't really showing job loss by quarter. Second, there's no y-axis labels. So the scale of the chart is questionable and there's not really consistency in the spread of data. If you look, the differences between the four data points appear about the same, but we're really looking at changes of you know, 2 million in the first one, and then 4.5 million, and then 1.5 million. So not the same size, obviously. And the same with the x-axis, if you look. These time points aren't equidistant apart, so the plotting of these data points is really misrepresenting what the trend is. The trend is the chart is showing a steady upward trend that looks pretty significant, when that's not really the case if you were to plot it out in a more appropriate way. So this is a good example of what not to do when you're working with a line chart. On the next slide, we have a more fun topic than job loss. Uh, here we have an infographic showing us how baby boomers describe themselves. You've got a figure here that's broken out into sections by color. So if I saw that, I'd think, well, each section here must be a portion of the whole, which should add up to 100%. But if you look at all these data points, you'll see that the numbers don't add up. It's got 40%, 61%, 22%. So these are actually representing separate questions and don't relate to each other as a part of one whole, which is how it's visualized. And then if you continue looking, you'd think that the size of the section would represent the value. So you see that red, which is most of the torso, is 61%, and purple, which is basically only the knees here, is 78%. So the value for purple is greater, but the red section looks much bigger which is, again, pretty confusing to the user. And then finally, you'll see that some of these points have a quote describing it. So we've got green, the green value and blue value both have a label with more information, but not the others. So why are you including these instead of the others? Do the others not have a description? Overall, this is just a confusing picture that takes way too long to actually read in and find any meaning in. Finally, I've got one more example to share. Here, we've got a chart that shows the changing face of America. So it's the percent of the total US population by race and ethnicity over a 100 year period. Now, when I first look at this, I immediately think that it's trying to tell me that the population in the red colored states is white and the blue strips must be where the black population lives and Maine apparently is mostly other. But obviously that's not the case. What the creators of this visualization have really done is put a line chart on top of a map. And so when you go from left to right across time, you can see how the trends have changed. But if the data has nothing to do with geography, it only confuses the reader to overlay it on a map. And if you keep looking, you'll see that in 1960, the data labels add up to 95%, and then only 92% in 2010, and 75% in 2060. So where did the rest of that population go? We don't even see any other colors in 2010, but I'm pretty sure that people of Asian race or ethnicity and others existed. So the labeling here is really confusing, and the way they've chosen to make this map just isn't ideal. Really, a stacked bar or a stacked line chart would have been the more appropriate type of chart to use with this data set. 
So those are bad examples. I want to leave you now with some resources on the next slide that will help you make much better ones. There are some really great resources from the last decade or two on creating good visualizations and charts. I do also want to mention that the examples I've shown you here from our NCHEMS work were all made in Tableau, but there are so many different tools that you can use now to make good data visualizations. And so here I've included resources for not only Tableau, but also for R and SAS. Um, and if there's something else you use, I'm sure someone has written a guidebook for it with some of the same tips and tricks and, and instructions for how to do it in whatever tool you're using. So just know that you don't have to navigate all this on your own, and there is certainly plenty of help out there for you to figure out how to do this well. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Sally. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, and those of you that are watching, please do post questions for Rachel. But let's shift now to one of our topics about tips for higher education data. Linda? Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> Behind every data viz should be data. In following up to what Rachel just pointed out about best practices, I want to take a few minutes to discuss the iPad surveys and some best practices for using this large collection of data. At NCHEMS, we often use data from the iPad surveys in our projects. iPads is the integrated post-secondary education data system. It is a collection of surveys done every year by NCES, which is the National Center for Education Statistics. NCS survey, surveys over 6,000 institutions in the U.S. and its territories. IPEDS collects data at the institutional level and includes surveys on finance, enrollments, and completions, just to name a few. On this slide is the URL to download the data files from the NCS website. The most recent year is 2018, and they have files all the way back to 1980. As a side note, not all data files are available for all years you can pick the year and the survey. Anyone can download the data files. You will need to extract the data file on your local machine and use a statistical software package to, look, to work with the data. One of the best practices to keep in mind when you are working with iPEDS data is the time period that the data file is covering. All of the files on this slide are listed under the 2018 year. The first five surveys are for the fall of 2018. The next six surveys cover the year 2017 through 18. The completions file named C2018A covers 2017-18, while the enrollment file named EF2018A is for the fall of 2018. If you are analyzing completions and enrollment data together, make sure you have the correct files to correspond to the same time frame. Here is a visual example of the time periods that completions and enrollment surveys cover. You can see that the Fall Enrollment 2018 file is for the time period after the completions 2017-18 data file. Therefore, you would want to use the Fall Enrollment 2017 file, EF2017A. Another thing to note about using the iPad data sets is that iPEDS collects and releases data sets at different times throughout the year. Here is a graphic showing when the different surveys are released. Since the different iPEDS survey files are released at different times, you might, have access, might not have access to all of the 2018 files at once. This is good to keep in mind when you're planning your analysis. After the institutions report their data to iPEDS, it takes NCES nine months to release a provisional file for public use. Final data files are released after another 12 months when the institutions have had time to review and revise what was reported the previous year. At NCHEMS, we use the provisional files when they become available and update to the final files when they are eventually released. NCES reports that only between one to 6% of institutions actually change any of their data in the final files. In summary, some of the best practices to use with iPEDS data is to be aware of the time frame that the data file covers, and remember that not all of the data files are released at the same time. Okay, well, thank you, Linda. Uh, continuing on the data theme, John, will you take us through some additional tips? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sally. Um, 
So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes um, pre presenting some background information about the American Community Sur Survey. And then I'm going to present a couple issues that users need to pay attention to um, when using American Community Survey data. Um, unlike the IPEDS uh, data, which um, is a census of a population, um, th the Census Bureau's American Community Survey is a sample of households and population across the U.S., uh, including Puerto Rico. Uh, the American Community Survey uh, is the premier source for annual household and population demographic, social and economic data, which uh, NCHAMP uses consistently for its ongoing project work. Data tables and estimates published from the American Community Community Survey can be downloaded from the Census Bureau at data.census.gov or from factfinder.census.gov, which, which is actually being phased out and is only available until March 31 of this year. So users, users will need to uh, tap into data.census.gov for, for those information. Uh, Census Bureau also provides uh, some public use microdata samples for download, which are actually a subset of the full ACS sample due to confidentiality and additional statistical procedures uh, which they apply. Um, but the public use files allow users to run their own custom data sets uh, that, that might not be available from the published tables. Public use files can be difficult to work with due to the millions of records and large number of variables. Uh, however, the same data can actually be accessed um, quite a bit easier through the ipums.org website. Um, which is a University of Minnesota ongoing research project uh, and platform for researchers to easily access and use census and, and survey microdata. Uh, next slide, please. So the American Community Survey is conducted in about 3.5 million households each year, including about 170,000 persons in group quarters, uh, such as college, college dormitories, uh, prisons, and nursing homes. Um, this is all relative to the 140 million households uh, in the eight, 8 million persons living in group quarters uh, that are actually eligible for the survey. So it's a, it's a large survey, but it's actually a very small sample of the population and thus can be subject to a fair amount of st statistical area, which users uh, should really be aware of. With each published estimate from the American Community Survey, the Census Bureau provides um, what's called the 90% margin of error. And the margin of error is a measure of how close our estimate might really be from the true population number uh, and is expressed in terms of our estimate plus or minus the stated margin of error. 90% uh, confidence level refers to the to level at which the errors are calculated at, uh, meaning we would expect that if all possible samples of the population could be taken, 90% of the resulting estimates and associated confidence intervals would contain the true population estimate. So if the margin of error is small relative to our estimate, uh, then we know there's a high probability that our estimate is close to the true population figure. Um, however, if the margin of error is large relative to the estimate, then our estimate, um, uh, margin of error is large relative to the estimate, then we know that our estimate may not actually reflect the true population estimate. And the actual, actual population figure uh, may fall far from our estimate. Uh, for users of the public use files, the Census Bureau actually provides a couple of options for calculating the margin of error. And those methods can be found in the technical document documentation associated with those files. Uh, as we'll see, ignoring the margins of error associated with these estimates um, can lead to misinterpretation, misinterpretation of the data and incorrect analyses. Um, so I'm going to present a couple of data charts that demonstrate the importance of recognizing um, and using the margins of error that are included with the, the published American Community Survey estimates and uh, which I noted earlier can be calculated when working with the uh, public use microdata samples. So um, on this chart, uh, we have four data points plotted, uh, which were run from the American Community Survey public use uh, microdata samples. Um, they represent the average annual net migration of college degree holders aged 22 to 64. By three year time frame, um, 2007-09 through the time period 2016-18. Um, and these data are, are for Ohio. Um, these points have been plotted by three year time frame to try and help increase sample size and thus reduce the statistical error in the estimates. Um, what we conclude from this plot, just taking a look at it, um, is a nice upward trend in net migration. Um, so Ohio is changing from a net exporter of college degree holders uh, in the earlier time frames to a net importer of degree holders in the more current time frames. So if we take a look at the next slide, um, 
you'll see here if we actually calculate and plot the associated 90% margins of error about the estimates, we notice that the estimates are not so stable with large errors bounding them, even with the three-year time frames. Um, margins of error are as large or larger than the estimates themselves. Our true population figures could potentially be falling rather far from, from these estimates, and thus the trend we see in our plotted estimates could actually be something uh, very different, uh, possibly even a flat or negative trend, or there may not even, even be any apparent trend at all. Um, so ignoring the margins of error here could lead us uh, to some false conclusions about the net migration of degree holders in Ohio. Uh, so generally users of sample data, whether from the American Community Survey or any other survey, um, really should exercise caution um, when these margins of error are large um, relative to the estimate themselves. Um, and what, one last item to note, uh, most of the estimates from the American Community Survey are very good, um, particularly for geographic areas that have large populations. Um, however, users should be aware that, that when crossing multiple items, um, like in this chart where we have migration uh, crossed with age and education attainment, um, or, or when looking at geographies with smaller populations, um, like counties and census tracts, uh, the sample sizes can, can really deteriorate quickly uh, and result in estimates with less statistical certainty than, than what we'd like to see. Um, so that's all I have about the American Community Survey. Um, so back to you, Sally. Well, thank you, John. Uh, now we'll shift uh, our perspective a bit and move into a more presentational framework. Gina? Thank you, Sally. Uh, Rachel presented some promising practices for creating visualizations, and you just heard from both Linda and John sharing tips for accessing and using some of the large public data sets that we frequently use here at NCHEMS. And I'm going to dig a little bit further into a topic that Rachel brought up at the beginning of her presentation, which is how to work with the audience for the data visualization that you're creating. And I'm going to begin on the next slide with a picture. I uh, thought I'd stick on the theme of visualization and start with a picture on my own presentation, not a data visualization, but, but something to share with you. Uh, the concept that there is really interconnection between the audience, the visualization type that you choose, and your role as information provider. And I'm presenting this on this webinar with the perspective of the information provider, knowing that some of you listening to this webinar might very well be, uh, at some points, in your work, the audience of data visualization, and some of you may be the information provider. Um, and so I did, I will admit, make the information provider cog in this machine here a little bit bigger, uh, guessing that most of you are spending some of your time, if not most of your time, in that role, and we here at NCHEM certainly are. Um, on the next slide, like Rachel, I'd like to share some questions that help guide work with an audience. And uh, I've adapted these questions a little bit, um, or my presentation of these questions, from the book Effective Reporting. And I put the citation down there at the bottom if you want to take a look at it. When it was written, it wasn't necessarily designed specifically for data visualization. But as I read it, I really thought that it fits really tightly into what we were talking about, and especially reinforces what Rachel was sharing uh, in her presentation. So I think an exciting challenge for those who create and share data visually is considering all the ways an audience might use it to interpret the information. And I really see that as part of the role of information provider is to help uh, translate that data into information. And I'll touch on that a bit later as well. And so going through these questions, I want to start with what does the audience need to know? And you'll notice uh, question one and two are very similar. They just have that one word in italics that's different. And so the audience need to know, for this part, it's your job as the information provider uh, to tease out the questions that they're trying to get at. So I know oftentimes in my career uh, as a data analyst, and in my case, institutional researcher, or someone who worked at an institution to help the folks in higher education, learn what it is that they were doing well and could do better. Some people would come to me and ask for data. And I could give them some data, but I think what they were really asking me for was an answer to a question. They just didn't necessarily know how to tease out that question or word that question exactly right. So I see step one, question one, 
figuring out what your audience needs to know as your job is to help them figure out what that question is. And then once you've got that question down, you can move on to number two here, which is what does the audience want to know? So they've decided what they need to know in order to make a decision or at least get some information that will help them in their work. And what do they want to know? This is where you really come in to anticipate what other questions, the information you provide for them via your visualization is going to spark. Because we often know that an answer to a question sparks new questions. And so they might know what they need to know, and you might figure out what they want to know. And in this visualization, hopefully you're going to be able to present both of those things and get all kinds of needs met of your audience. The third question then is, what do I want to tell them? And this is where you really rely on your context knowledge and your ability to figure out the questions they aren't asking. So once you run the data, do your analysis and, and create your visualization, you can start to add in pieces that you found interesting in your analysis that maybe really enhance what they need to know, what they want to know. And now you can figure out what do I want to tell them that they didn't even know they wanted to know, but I figured it out while I was doing this analysis. Fourth question in this process is to think about what decisions might the audience make considering this information. And this is a little bit different than just figuring out what it is that they need or want to know. This is making data into information and information into actionable information. And this is really that important stage. Oftentimes we're trying to get information because we want to make a decision. How should we utilize our financial aid dollars in order to benefit the most students? Or how should we tweak the hours of our course offerings at a higher education institution to ensure that the most students can make the most classes and make the most out of their day? We want to be able to do action based on these decisions. And that's really where we're thinking about uh, what decisions the audience might make and you anticipating those, or again, working with them to tease those out before you do the uh, data visualization is going to make that visualization even better and more useful for them. The fifth question is, with whom might the audience share this information? So you're thinking about your audience that has come to you with their question and their request. And you also need to be thinking about who are they going to be sharing this with? It might just be for them to make a decision themselves. It might be that they're going to bring it to their boss, the president of the university, the board of the university, to students themselves to help those individuals make some decisions. So it's important to anticipate who else might see the information or who else is likely to see the information and ensure that you sort of expand your idea of your audience in your mind and keep those folks in the back of your mind as well. Obviously the audience who's come to you directly with the request is key and they're the, the primary audience, but think about who else they might be sharing this with because there might be more context and more information that you wanna present because of that. And finally, the sixth question on this set of questions to help you convey information is who else might be interested in this information? This to me is different than the who might the audience share this with because this is again where you can use your content and context knowledge to help the audience make their decisions actionable based on the visualization you've created for them. So they might not have known that there's another group at your institution or your system or your state thinking about these similar questions and making different levels of decisions based on them. And so when you get requests from an audience and maybe you get a request from another audience that actually are getting at similar actionable questions, you can connect those folks and think about that. You can ask your audience if it's all right if you share this with this other group or you can connect them directly to get them to uh, work together to make these decisions really actionable based on the visualizations that you've provided. And finally, on my last slide, I wanna talk a little bit about your role as information provider. And again, speaking to the context that I believe many of you on this webinar, at least at some point in your work, are those who create data visualizations to help other people or yourselves make decisions. And I like these two terms because I think they really help me picture what it is that my work is involved. One is the translator. You're the translator of data into information. Again, as I mentioned, you have the context, you have the data, 
you have the analytics knowledge to help other people figure out what it is that they need to know to answer their questions. And so translation is really about translating an audience's needs into questions, finding the data they need to answer those questions, and then turning those data into information to make actionable responses to those questions. The other one I like to think about is a concierge. And I'm not sure how many of you travel very often or if you've used a concierge when you've been in a city that you're not as familiar with, but the an analogy here is that sometimes when I'm visiting a city, I'll go to the concierge in a new hotel and ask them exactly where this restaurant is that I've looked up online and I wanna go to. And they'll show me on the map or tell me how to get there or whether I can walk or I need to drive. Sometimes though, I get to a city and I wanna know what's best. What's the best food in the neighborhood? Where do locals go? And that's where this concierge can really tease out, help me figure out those questions that I might not know I have and get me to the place that's actionable. In this case, a fun restaurant, potentially in a new city. In our case, as data providers and information providers, that's the stage where we are teasing out those questions and getting folks to the spot on the map, meaning the decisions they want to make. And that's, I think, an exciting role for us. So translator and concierge, think of those two as your job as information provider. And I'm gonna turn it back to Sally. Well, thank you, Gina. Now it's time to turn to some questions. And uh, we're gonna have Sarah work as our uh, question asker in this case, from your questions and others. And so Sarah, let me turn that over to you. Thank you, Sally. So we'll start with Rachel. Rachel, do you have any tips for turning dynamic visualizations into static reports? And this might be in the case where higher education leaders might want just the basic information or a snapshot of data. Sure, thanks Sarah. Uh, I think as I mentioned in my earlier presentation, you know, using labeling is gonna be really important there. You wanna make sure that something is still understandable um, and can be interpreted correctly, even if you don't have all the dynamic features. So, um, you know, you wanna be careful to use some of the hover over features because once you make that into a static visualization, those aren't gonna be there anymore. And the same with some of your filters. You know, you might be able to see what you're looking at based on what filter is selected, but once you remove those filters, you need to be able to still interpret the chart correctly. And so you need to make sure your labels are coming through no matter how you, um, what kind of dynamic features you've added to it. And again, just following all the other best practices, making sure that things are built in a way that allows for them to be printed nicely, um, for snapshots to be taken, that the colors are gonna be visible no matter how you're looking at it. And just thinking about all of those things ahead of time when you're starting to build visualization, whether it's static or dynamic. Thanks, Rachel. And Linda, do you have an opinion or any information that we can use about when it's okay to use provisional IPEP data? Uh, thank you, Sarah. I, when I started a project, I always look to see which data files are available, the most recent ones. And if I can have, if all of them are available for the year that I am working for, then I will start with the provisional data. And then as you go backwards, then you run into the final data sets that have been released. So, you know, as long as you have, if you're working with all of the data the data sets that you need are available for the year, then go ahead and use the provisional data. If they're not all available for that year, then you need to go back and use you know, a, an older year that's available. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Linda. And I have a question for John. John, when working with large data sets, do you have any recommendations on considerations to keep in mind when choosing software that works best to handle that data? I think John might be on mute. There he is. Apologies, I was on mute. I, I have that taken care of. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, when using the public use files um, from the American Community Survey, you can be working with um, as many as 15 million records in some cases, um, and that's in the five-year uh, 
data files that they put out. Um, and even the one year annual files um, have, has, have as many as three, three to 3.5 million uh, cases. So um, it's good to have a statistical package of some sort to work with um, those large data sets. Um, I, personally, I use um, SPSS, um, which, which works well um, uh, uh, with those data. Um, uh, a higher powered statistical package, um, something like SAS, um, will run, run through those um, data uh, quite a bit faster. Um, so uh, I, I think it's just um, uh, what the u users prefer, um, what, the, what they're used to using, um, as, as long as the package can, can handle the, 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 you know, those number of cases. Um, any data um, like pulled from the, um, the Census Bureau's uh, American Community Survey um, their, from their published tables. Um, and those are pretty user friendly and already aggregated, um, so you can just, you know, using Excel or um, any other um, software package you're comfortable with uh, works just fine. Um, so anyway, that's uh, what I have on that. Thanks. And I also have another question for you. I'm wondering if you could share any tips you might have for dealing with large margins of error. Yeah, um, it's, that sort of just depends on uh, what, what you're using the information for. Um, it, uh, if, you know, if, if uh, you're looking at some estimates that you're going to be, um, you know, where there's uh, maybe uh, fundings involved or money's involved, um, obviously you want to have uh, some, some smaller margins of error to uh, I inform that before making decisions. Um, Sometimes as a researcher, um, just getting an idea for what uh, your estimate might be and getting, uh, you know, finding what that range might be. Um, and, you know, a, lar a large margin of error in that case might be acceptable. Um, and a lot of times um, it helps to just take a look at the size of the numbers. I mean, uh, what, what's the size of your estimate? Um, what, you know, what's the largest uh, potential value um, that, that your estimate might be in? Take a look at what the smallest value might be and then that compare and then compare that to the the population that you're talking about um, it, if you're dealing with some smaller numbers relative to your population then, may, then maybe those large margins of error aren't, aren't such a big deal um, but um, if, if it's covering uh, if your estimates covering a large part of the population and you've got large margins of error then it's, then it's uh, maybe not as useful um, so you can still extract some information um, uh, from those data, even even when you've got some large margins of error, um, but a lot of it just depends on what what uh, you're using your estimate for, um, and and how big the population is relative to the estimate you're looking at is. Thanks, John. Sure. Gene, I have a question for you. Do you have any suggestions on what to do if you're asked to create a report or a dynamic visualization without a specific audience in mind? Thanks, Sarah. That's a great question. And I don't think that's all that uncommon. I know that that I had that situation happen to me uh, in the past in my work. Um, you know, maybe my supervisor said um, that they thought somebody might be interested in this or, hey, we should be looking at these data and we should be analyzing it and, and doing some visualizations to see what we see. And I think in that case, it's important to, again, turn to your own knowledge of the context of the setting in which you're working, again, whether it be an individual institution, a system of institutions, or you know, a whole state. And in our case, at end times we work in you know, thinking about higher education. Um, because I think it's important to, for you as the person who knows the context and knows the data and is analyzing the data through this visualization process to think about who would benefit from seeing this. So it's, you know, it's kind of like, um, the sixth question in, in the set of questions I presented, the who else might be interested in this information. You know, I think uh, sometimes pushing data visualization, pushing information to people who didn't even know that we had data on this that could answer questions that we're anticipating from them is a good thing to do. So I think it's, it makes it more challenging, um, but I think in, in kind of an exciting way for the information provider to not only be needing to analyze the data and visualize it, but also think about, hey, who should I point to this? Who needs to know this in order to make decisions uh, that'll benefit uh, students? Wonderful, thanks so much. And a question for both you, Gina and Rachel. So what about the case in which Maybe you're presenting a visualization to an audience and it just 
leads to more and more questions. Any suggestions you could share on how to handle that? Sure, I'll go ahead and start. Um, as someone who's been an analyst in a lot of different roles over the years, I think one of the easiest things you can do for yourself is document, document, document. So if you're working in a software system that allows you to you know, use syntax or write different code, save it. <laughs> if you're pulling your data together, pull as many things as possible and get it all set up because there will probably be more questions or more in-depth analysis you'll want to do. So make sure you're documenting what you do. Again, when you're visualizing it, that you've got labels and sources um, and legends and things like that so that you, when you come back to it a week, a month, however long, you know, however much longer and want to do more in-depth analysis, you're able to replicate that. So that would be my first suggestion. Gina, any from you? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Great idea. I think that's a, a great thing to think of. I know um, my future self is always appreciative of my past self <laughs> documenting as much as I can. Uh, another idea, too, that I think might help is, um, you know, to, to think about, as Rachel brought up in her presentation, when is a dynamic versus a static? data visualization appropriate. And I think um, it, it could be a fun challenge if you have someone coming back and saying, well, what about this way? What if you put the data this way? What if you include these but not these? If it's those type of questions that they're asking you, um, to, to really encourage them to, to allow you to, to change a, a static uh, visualization into a dynamic visualization and then kind of coach them how to ask those questions of the data themselves through this tool by filtering and, and by looking at the data in different ways. I think that could be a, a fun opportunity to really coach someone up and help them with their, their data literacy. Awesome, thank you both. And Rachel, I'm wondering if you have any tips on what things to keep in mind when you're choosing tools for making visualizations. Sure. Um, I think that can be a really tricky one because there's so many different things out there now and at many different price points and levels of complexity. And so I think you need to know what your capacity is, both in financial resources. Um, you know, some things are, are really easy with drag and drop menus. I would say Tableau is a pretty easy one to get started with. But to really do a lot of the cool stuff, you do need some programming capabilities. Um, and certainly you do with some of the other software tools that are out there. So really take stock of what your capacity is. And then again, look at what your intention, you know, your, the intention of the work that you're going to be doing most of. Do you really need a lot of fancy bells and whistles or do you just need something that's going to allow you to do analyses uh, more efficiently and again, create some simple charts. You know, just because a software tool has all of these amazing things you can do, it doesn't mean you're ever going to need those. And so why get yourself in a bigger financial and time hole um, than you need to? So, so I would say think about what your capacity is and then think about what, how you're really going to use the tool before you get um, sold a much fancier product than you may need. Thank you, Rachel. Sally? Thanks, Sarah. Um, let me circle back here for just a minute and ask Gina if she has any final thoughts she'd like to share. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, we presented a lot of information today, and I saw some some questions in the Q and A coming up about the um, you know, whether people could see the the slides, and you know, Sarah has an answer for that. But I I think probably they're asking for that because there's a lot of good resources, um, particularly the list that that Rachel left. And I would just say that you know, in my experience, data visualization tools, as Rachel was talking about are really expanding rapidly. And so expectations, I think, of our audiences are expanding rapidly. And so um, luckily, information out is out there, and that's also expanding rapidly, to help people figure out the best ways to, to do these things. And so um, you know, I'll just plant the seed that sometimes, and this is why Rachel did it, presenting sort of bad examples is incredibly helpful to think about what are the good ways we want to, to present our data and information, and there's lots of great resources out there to learn new ways to do that. Thank you, Gina. And Rachel, do you have any last thoughts? Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, as an analyst, really have fun with the process of creating visualizations. 
I know in my experiences, I haven't always gotten to do the most creative things. And so this is really a chance to get to have fun with the data and communicate it in a way that you think will be interesting for the people you're working with. That's great advice. Uh, I do want to let everyone know that this webinar will be archived at the nchims.org site, and we encourage you to share that link with others that you think might enjoy it. And I personally want to thank my colleagues, Rachel Christensen, uh, Linda Leba, John Clark, and Gina Johnson for sharing their expertise and experiences. And with that, we'll close. <laughs>